All right, it's Brian. And in this video, we're gonna go one step beyond. We're gonna talk about the philosophical implications of quantum mechanics. And the title I use for it is this, is the moon there when no one's looking? And exactly what I mean by that is something that I'll come back and talk about later. Now, it's clear that science has lessons to teach us. You know this, you folks who are science students, and when you learn about science, it's not just the specific facts, but it's the way that science orders the world. For instance, for years, people had this idea that things worked according to basic deterministic physical laws. They had this clockwork version of the universe, and people had this idea that since everything evolves according to these wonderful laws worked out by Isaac Newton and others, that if you know where everything was and you knew the forces acting on everything, you could use Newton's laws and other laws to predict where everything was going to be in the future. Everything would unfold just like clockwork. It was an extremely mechanistic view of the world. And Newtonian physics was extremely powerful and predicted things like the position of the planets uh, over time. It predicted the paths of projectiles through the air, and so much more. And so people had this idea that this new science tells us that the world is this clockwork universe and everything unspools with this grace and this mechanistic precision. But in fact, that is not the world of quantum mechanics. The reality of what quantum mechanics has to teach us is considerably fuzzier than this, which is one of the reasons why I picked a puppy, but I also picked a puppy because the reality of what quantum mechanics teaches us is disturbing to some degree. So I thought, oh, let's just put something cute on this picture. Now, as I start to talk about this, I want to be very clear, there are other stories. We're getting into the realm of philosophy, we're getting into the realm of belief, we're getting into the realm of how people think about the world, and I do not want to step on the toes of other stories. I respect and I, I understand and appreciate the other stories that people tell. I'm not contradicting anything, I'm just saying here's one particular physical theory, and here's what it tells us about the world, but there are other stories I respect and I appreciate them all. Now let's talk about some quantum weirdness and the things that I find kind of like odd and disturbing about quantum mechanics. And the first piece is non-locality. So if you take a beam of electrons and you shine it through a double slit, you get this pattern on the screen. And the pattern on the screen that you get is this. You get regions where lots of electrons hit and you get regions where no electrons hit. You get bright and dark fringes. Now that is something that is very much a property of waves. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to look at so-called diffraction patterns that occur when you have light goes through a double slit. And so we're going to talk about that. But you get it with electrons. And so when the electron goes through a slit, it goes through and the way you describe its interaction with the slit is as a wave. And the electron doesn't go through the left slit or the right slit. It goes through both. It goes through both of them. And as a matter of fact, if you try to measure which slit it went through, you destroy the pattern that appears here. And so the L electron has this absolute non-locality. It's very wavish. The wave that is the electron goes through both slits, which is kind of crazy. But you've seen this non-locality before because you've seen pictures of things like a p orbital. And in a p orbital, the electron is here above the xy plane and here below the xy plane it is in both places the reality of the electron is smeared out where it's really in both places and so particles can absolutely be in two places at one time in quantum mechanics and that is very very disturbing now here's the thing as the particle is going through here it's looking distinctly wavishly but when it hits the screen something else happens and that brings us to the next disturbing thing about quantum mechanics, and that's the wave function collapse. So the particle goes through the slits. The two waves interfere with each other, but when they hit the screen, you don't get something fuzzy. You get something point-like. What? So it looked like it was smeared out, but when it hits the screen, you never see the smeared outness. You only see the dot. It looks like a particle. It was a wave, and then fake, it's a particle. It's kind of a crazy thing. Now, when you build up the pattern, you get this overall distribution where I get light regions where lots of electrons hit and I get dark regions where no electron hits. And so you get this kind of like interesting pattern. 
And it looks like a continuous pattern, but it is not. It is made up of dots where an electron hits or not. And so you get this wave function collapse. So it's acting like a wave and then all of a sudden it acts like a particle. And that brings up this idea of duality. Is the electron, is it a wave or is it a particle? Well, it starts out acting like a wave, but when it hits the screen, it acts like a particle. Is it a particle or is it a wave? Yes, it's a particle or it's a wave. It is what it needs to be, depending on what you're asking it to do. And that's kind of weird. I want the world to be definite. I want things to be waves or particles. I'm comfortable with both, but I want them to choose. And the electron does not choose. As a matter of fact, it shape shifts and goes back and forth from one to the other. The most clear example this I've ever seen is someone made a buckyball. And you know what a buckyball is? It's this, this carbon 60 kind of like thing where I have like 60 carbons arranged in this lattice. Looks like a soccer ball. You can make an image of one. Here's an image of one made with an electron microscope, and you can see where the individual carbons are. This thing looks like a particle, but when you pass it through a double slit, you get a diffraction pattern, and so you can see it. You can take a picture of it. It looks very particle-y, but it will act like a wave. And as a matter of fact, there doesn't seem to be any limits on how big you can make something and have it act like a particle and act like a wave, which is deeply, deeply disturbing to me. Now, another thing that happens, and we talked about this briefly in the class when we talked about this idea of a Bose-Einstein condensate. If you take certain kinds of particles and you take their wave function like so, and you bring in a second particle and you put it on top of the first, the two will overlap. And you bring in a third and you bring in a fourth and you bring in a fifth and you bring in a sixth. You just make this giant wave function. And this one right here is the wave function of a whole bunch of particles that are actually on top of each other. So one particle can be in two places at one time, or two particles, or 10 particles, or 10,000 particles can be in the same place at the same time. And this is 10,000 atoms in the same place. Their wave functions are overlapping. They are literally on top of each other. And there's no problem with that. As a matter of fact, the particles are happy about it. That is their preferred state to be completely on top of each other, which is kind of crazy. And so this superposition notion is bizarre. I do not want to live in a world where I can take one particle, put it in a region of space, and put another one, and it preferentially exists exactly in the same place where the first particle was. That is a crazy, crazy indeed quantum world. Now, another bizarre thing is we have this notion of tunneling. Here's an ammonia atom, and I'm sure you've seen pictures of this. There's three hydrogen atoms, which make this little triangle. And then there's a nitrogen atom, which makes like the apex of a tetrahedron. It exists here, up above the triangle made up by the three hydrogens. And then, sometime later, it will exist down here but it never existed in between. It ceases existing up above and begins existing down below without ever existing in between. That's something known as quantum mechanical tunneling. And so something can stop existing one place and begin existing someplace else, even if it's completely forbidden from existing in the middle. And that is kind of a weird thing. And it has to do with this non-locality of, of, of quantum phenomena. And you can actually make pictures with this. Some of the really detailed images, like the picture of the buckyball, are made using what's called known as a scanning tunneling microscope. And the way it works is this. I take a probe and I bring it near a surface, and then electrons will tunnel from the surface into the tip. There's a vacuum in between the two, and nothing exists. There are no electrons in this region in between, no electrons whatsoever to be found. They cease existing in the sample. They begin existing in the tip, and it turns out whether the particle can tunnel from what the sample to the tip is a strong function of the distance. And so if you take this probe and you sweep it back and forth over the surface, you get a very, very detailed image of how of the, the peaks and the valleys of the surface. And you do that by using this tunneling. So tunneling, though it seems weird, is actually used as an experimental technique. It's kind of a crazy, crazy thing. And here's a picture. And this is a picture made of graphite. And you can see clearly, like here's the carbon atoms. 
in the graphite. I can see this little hexagonal lattice. And the way you made, did this was taking this probe tip, bringing it back and forth over the surface. And where you get lots of current, lots of electrons are choosing to tunnel, that tells you you're close to the surface. And where you get few, that tells you you're far away. And you can make these amazing detailed images that way. Now the most the bizarre thing is this. If you take an ammonia atom and you freeze it so that it's kind of like stuck in place, you would say, okay, it's either like this with the nitrogen atom up or it's like this with the nitrogen atom down. But in fact, what it will be is it will be in the situation of being up and down at the same time. It's in this weird mixed state. And this so upset Erwin Schrodinger um, that he said, Let's, let's do this. Let's imagine an experiment where I have this like vial of poison inside a box and I have a cat here and there's a radioactive atom. And if the radioactive atom decays, it opens up the vial of poison and it kills the cat. And let's suppose I put in one atom and, it, and the one atom has a half-life of one minute. Now, if you take one atom and it has a half-life of one minute, after one minute, it's not that it has a 50% chance of decaying. It's that it is 50% decayed and 50% not decayed. And that is in fact how you have to treat it. The atom is literally in this mixed state. And that really, really upset Erwin Schrodinger. I said, so if I imagine I have this box and this box is sealed, nobody's able to see it. There's a 50%, there's a 50-50 atom is 50% decayed, 50% undecayed. And so I'm gonna have a 50% spilled vial of poison and 50% unspilled. And so I'm going to have a 50% live and a 50% dead cat. That doesn't make any sense. And so he brought up this Schrodinger's cat idea as kind of like a, an extreme version of, of expressing his displeasure with, displeasure with this notion. Now, nobody thinks you can have half alive and half dead cats. And that's kind of a a mean, nasty example. So we're not going to worry about that. But in fact, you can have, if you have an atom inside the box and it has a half-life of one minute, one minute later, it is 50% there and 50% decayed. And it is literally in this mixed state. And until somebody observes it, it will be. And the world is made up of things in these mixed states, which is kind of a crazy thing. Now, another weird thing is this notion of indistinguishability. Now we're familiar with the concept of two things being identical, like these twins are identical. But particles, like electrons, are indistinguishable. They are absolutely indistinguishable. It's not that they're the same. They are literally the same particle. I mean, you, you can change them and there's no way to tell. And I'll show you how this works. If I have these two balls, one of them is red and one of them is green. How many different ways are there to arrange the two balls and the two containers? Well, you know. You know how to do this, okay? If you take those two balls and put them in the two containers, I have four different ways to arrange them. I have four different ways to arrange them. But suppose I've got two electrons and how can I arrange those in the two containers? Well, here's the thing. Electrons, you can't put two in one container. I can only put one but how many ways can you, you, can you do it? Well, you might say, well, the electron one goes over on the left side and electron two goes on the right, or I could put electron one on the right and electron two on the left, but that isn't different because the electrons are not just identical, they are indistinguishable. You cannot label them. You can't have electron one and electron two. You could just have electrons, and if you switch places, it's exactly the same. How many ways are there to put the electrons in the containers? Just one. They are indistinguishable. If you come and you swap the two, you can't tell. There is no physical measurement that can be made that can distinguish between those two. The electrons are not just identical. They are indistinguishable. Switching them changes absolutely nothing about the universe. And so quantum statistics are very, very different than regular statistics. Now, the weirdest thing of all to me is this idea of entanglement. So I can have these particles in these mixed states, but it gets worse. So let's look at this idea of entanglement again, and I want to explore a particular situation. Suppose I've got this system that emits particle, or emits photons, and it's going to emit pairs of photons, and one of them is going to be polarized vertically, and the other is going to be polarized horizontally. But in fact, what it does is it mixes, it, it, it emits them in these mixed states. The particle that goes to the left is a 50-50 mix of a 
photon polarized vertically and one polarized horizontally. The one that goes to the right is a 50-50 mix of one that goes, one that is oriented horizontally and one that is polarized vertically. And so I got a 50-50 mix that goes in each direction. And so I get this 50-50 mix of particles that goes to the left and a 50-50 mix of particles that goes to the right. Then they hit the detectors. Now suppose the detector on the left measures the particles first and it measures vertical polarization. Well then immediately the one on the right becomes horizontal. And so the one on the left became vertical. Horizontal is no longer an option. The one on the right Vertical is no longer an option, it is horizontal. And so the measurement that I made here on the left makes the version on the right come into existence, which is kind of crazy. So the measurement I made over here on the left, and it can be at some distance, it can be 10 kilometers away from the detector on the right. Whatever measurement I make here on the left forces the one on the right to be in that state. And so I get this wave function collapse over a great distance. And people want to use this for cryptography. You can't use this to send a message, but I could use it to send a key that I could use to encode a message. And if I have a thing creating a beam of particles and one person detects the one string of horizontal and vertical, the other person detects a similar string of horizontal and vertical, it's exactly opposite the first one. And so I'm going to have two random strings which are exactly correlated. And if anybody tries to read this, someone tries to intercept the signal, you can tell it's been read because if it's been read, it changes the results in very subtle ways. So you can tell your message has been received securely. Nobody else has read it. And the message that you get is the exact complement of the thing that someone else got. So we have two keys and there's only two people in the world that possess them. So you could use this for cryptography, but it's kind of a crazy, crazy notion of entanglement that what happens here immediately affects what happens here. And it can be a long, long distance away. Now another aspect of this quantum weirdness is this. Suppose I have two beam lines that are kind of like beams of particles and beam lines don't really look like this, but you know, you get the idea. So we have a, a beam of particles which is going down this top tube. Whatever happens up here can affect the particles going through the bottom tube. And so I get this non-locality. Something about the particles up here kind of like intrudes into the other thing. These two beams don't touch each other. They're completely separated physically, but you can do things to the beam at the top that affect the beam at the bottom. Some of the reality of the beam at the top kind of like intrudes on the beam at the bottom. You get these effects beyond the edges, and this is a real thing. I won't go into the details, but it is a real thing, and it really happens. Now it's time to come back to the philosophical implications of everything we've been talking about. What does everything we've been talking about with quantum mechanics tell us about the world? And the first piece, and this is something which I really quite like, is this. Everything is connected. If you make a measurement someplace, it affects measurements that happen a great distance away. It affects wave functions a great distance away. One beam of particles can affect another beam of particles that it doesn't even touch physically. Everything is connected in this really fundamental way. And something that you do can affect something in another physical system at some distance. It's kind of a, an interesting and comforting, comforting notion to me. Now another notion, and this one is 
is very, very interesting. I'm not sure if it's comforting. Observing reality alters reality. You saw when we had this like electron going through the double slit, electrons going through a double slit, it goes through both. It looks like a wave. When it comes out the other side, it always looks like a particle. Um, you, the observation that you made causes the wave function to change from being a wave to looking like a particle. Your observation forces it basically to pick a state. And, and so I think about this like when you're opening a present. If you're opening a present, the way you open a present, your observation of it, in principle, affects what you observe. When I was in college, we used to get back our quantum mechanics tests and our professor, Les Foldy, who knew all of our names, he would bring our papers to the uh, tables and he would put them in front of us and then we would take our papers and we would flip them over so that we could see what our grade was and our thought was you want to be very careful how you flip it over because if you flip it over one way just right you're going to get an A but if you flipped it over slightly differently oh you might end up with a very very different result that was kind of our thought because really your observation affects reality. It's not that reality is just sitting out there waiting for you to observe it. The observations that you choose to make actually changes the nature of reality, which is kind of a crazy, crazy weird notion, but we've seen this. If you observe one particle of those pair of coupled particles, you affect the other one. And the measurement that you choose to make actually makes a difference not just in the subsequent measurements, but actually in the nature of reality, which is kind of a crazy, crazy notion. Now, another thing I want to think about is this. If you were to describe like the most fundamental way of describing electrons and protons and other fundamental particles, it's with these wave functions. But you cannot observe the wave function. You can't observe this. It, a wave function of an electron might look like that, but when you observe it, it just looks like a particle. And so the fundamental reality, the deepest reality of what particles are, this wave function that makes them up, is something we can never see. We see the particle but the particle exists as this wave. Now we can calculate things about what the wave is going to do. We can make predictions of what observations we're going to make, but fundamentally, the observations that we have are limited. The deepest reality, the wave function, is something that we can't see. What we observe is not the deepest reality. And this notion is sort of difficult for Westerners to kind of wrap our mind around, but Eastern philosophy, this is a fairly straightforward notion. Um, we have this statement here from the Tao. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternable, eternally real. Um, and so there's this idea that there's this deepest reality that you can't know, which is part of Eastern philosophy. But it's also part of quantum mechanics. And I like the idea that the basic reality, the, or the, the, the physical theory that we have that seems to be our most basic, fundamental, true physical theory is one that at its core has a reality that we can't know. It's got this eternal Tao that we can't know, that we can't name. It's kind of an awesome, awesome notion. Now related to this is this notion, what we, we can only speak about what we can observe because what we can observe is we observe particles. When we observe a wave function, we cause it to collapse. We can speak about that. We can't speak about something if we can't observe it because it's that unknowable thing. So here's the question I began this lecture with, is the moon there when no one's looking? I mean, in principle, you can't say that it is because you can only speak about what you can observe. Now, in fact, the moon causes tides, et cetera, et cetera. We would notice in a hurry if the moon ceased to exist. That's so kind of a ridiculous question. But there are questions like that that people have asked over the years. And if you're talking about an electron or you're talking about a, an atom or something like that, you can only speak about the things that you can observe. And here's the way that you may have heard this. You've heard this expression, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is there to hear it, is there any sound? This came from quantum physics. This came from quantum physics. It was kind of an idea to kind of like bring up this idea that you can only speak about what you observe. So if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, is there any sound? Well, yes, there will be sound. I mean, that's a macroscopic thing, but if an atom decays in the forest, if a radioactive atom decays in the forest and no one's there with a Geiger counter, did it really decay? 
you can't say that it did. And at some fundamental level, that is really true. If you haven't observed it to decay, you cannot say that it has. And in some very real sense, it absolutely hasn't. And another notion I want to think about, and this one is perhaps the weirdest to me, some things are not just unknown. They are actually unknowable, and that's different because there's things that I don't know. I mean, there's lots that I don't know, and every day I discover new vistas, that, uh, new subjects that I didn't even dream existed, and I know nothing about them, so my ignorance grows by leaps and bounds every day. But this is saying there are things that are unknowable, like no matter how long I study, no matter how many measurements I make, no matter what I do, I cannot know those things. We had this problem here, which, and we had this, like, electron beam going through this double slit. And the question was, which slit did the electron go through? Did it go through the left or the right? And you can't say. And it's not just that you don't know. It is that it is unknowable. That kind of question, if you know which slit it went through, that changes the result. You have changed reality by merely knowing it. And so there's certain things that you, you cannot know. You absolutely cannot know. They are not just unknown. They are literally unknown knowable. Now this really upset Albert Einstein. He did not like this idea a lot, and that's why he was saying quantum mechanics is imposing, but an inner voice tells me that it is not yet the real thing. He was looking for a so-called hidden variables theory of quantum mechanics, and so he wanted to know, like, oh, sure, there are those things that we don't know, but there are these hidden variables that we haven't seen yet, that we haven't discovered, and those hidden variables will explain all those things, but it seems like there aren't any hidden variables. That does not seem to be the case. It just seems to be that there are certain things that are just absolutely unknowable. There is this eternal Tao that we can't name. It's kind of a crazy thing. And there is a part of the world that is absolutely fundamentally unknowable. So let's sum this up. What does quantum mechanics what does quantum mechanics teach us? I'm just thinking, let's look at the basic nature of reality as elucidated by quantum mechanics. And there's a couple of interesting features of it. One is it's connected. And I like that. If you measure one thing, it affects other things. In some real sense, we are all connected, which I think is very, very cool. Another piece of the puzzle is, is this, that it is unknowable. Not just unknown, but unknowable. There are things that are unknowable. And to me, those are the two things that are kind of the most central. Everything is connected, and there's some parts that are unknowable. And that is a really, really different way than we are accustomed to thinking about it. The Western way of looking at things is this very atomistic, mechanistic version of things. And the quantum mechanics view is very different. Everything is not separated. We can't break it down into individual pieces. Everything is connected. And there are certain pieces that we can never know. So it's this squishier, fuzzier, more connected version of reality than certainly I, 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 I thought was true when I was first studying physics. And I remember when I first learned about quantum mechanics and I had a philosophy class where someone was describing this to us, I was really upset by this because this was not well, the way I thought the universe should be. But in fact, if quantum mechanics is any guide, this is the world that we inhabit. It's connected and it's mysterious. Let's say that instead of unknowable. Let's say this. It's connected and it's got a certain mystery to it. I like that very much. That is the quantum world. And this is what quantum mechanics teaches us about the way the world works. Something that's been really interesting for me to watch over, over the years is there's a bunch of people that are trying to market quantum stuff. Like if you do a web search on quantum healing, there's all sorts of stuff out there. And people are saying like, oh yeah, the world is connected. And so if I do one thing over here, it's going to affect you over there. And, 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 and there's all kinds of craziness about that. And, and, and you can't use, don't, don't look to the internet and quantum healing if you have anything that's wrong with you. Science uses quantum mechanics, and so MRIs are based on quantum mechanics. MRIs are part of making people healthy. But don't look to quantum healing practitioners. This is not really a thing. This is just people are using the words to try to make a quick buck, and that's, that's not interesting. But the world we live in is connected, and it is mysterious. And that's what I want to leave you with, is this quantum world, this connected, mysterious world. That's the way that quantum mechanics 
tells us to think about things. The, the physics of quantum mechanics is one that is different than the mechanistic, atomistic version of the world that kind of like came into the fore after Isaac Newton. And I like this world in lots of different ways. If you have questions about this, I would very much encourage you to reach out and talk to me about this. I love talking about quantum mechanics. This is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. I love talking about physics and I love talking to you folks. So definitely reach out to me if you have any questions. But I hope that you have enjoyed your day in this connected, mysterious world. And I look forward to talking to you soon.